everyone going? I'm Catherine and this is Fiona and today we're going to take you all into or tell you about our eventful journey into the world of pizza. So Fiona and I, as uh, they mentioned, are Kiwis and we work in scrum, scrum teams as your stock standard um, software tester and yeah, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background as to how this all came about. So the, the developer on the team that I work in and I decided that we'd just start learning about security in general. And just to see if it was an area that we'd like to move into later on in our career. So to keep the momentum going and to keep the continuous learning flowing, she suggested that I do a project and then present at a conference. And so I had a wee think about it, and then I thought, actually, it's probably a really good idea. I'll take her up on that offer. So before I could begin, there was one thing that really freaked me out about the whole idea, and I really needed to overcome that first before I could start. And the thought of doing it alone absolutely terrified me, so I needed to rope myself in a buddy to do it with. Hi, I'm the buddy. So now that I'd been roped in, we needed to come up with a topic for our project. So we began to brainstorm a whole bunch of ideas of things we like to do, things we we're interested in, and things we used. There we were with this list of ideas. But when we discussed these with Catherine's developer friend, none of them really seemed right for beginners. And that's when we realized that there was one really obvious thing that we were missing. Pizza! So day one of the project, we decided that we'd put our hacker hoodies on and write code that would get us into the most complex, secure, and intricate systems out there. But our day one didn't really go down as we planned. Instead, we did something that we think is far more hacker-like. We wrote up a list of all the pizza places around us in an Excel spreadsheet. And basically we just mapped out of mapped out all the pizza places that were um, in New Zealand or in our local area and we just looked into whether they had websites available, whether they had online functionality, online ordering functionality, and whether they had apps that people could download onto like their tablets or mobiles um, and split those out into iOS versus Android. And just as a little disclaimer, you can see that everything's been kept anonymous and we're going to be keeping that theme throughout this whole presentation. So we've been told that every hacker needs to gather as much information as possible. And keeping that in mind and using that list that we just created, we decided to go onto the websites and map out all the functionality. We explored every clickable link, every picture and every pathway and mapped it all into Xmind. Only took us about two weeks to discover that this information was completely useless. So now we were a little bit stuck and we didn't know what to do. So we decided we'd hit up our mentor and see what the next steps were in this project. And so it turns out that there are a whole bunch of free websites out there that actually go and scan other websites for you and compile what their vulnerabilities are. So we used things like SSL Labs, Shodan, and Zap, and just typed our URLs of the pizza places in, and it would go run a scan, and then give us a report back, basically telling us a rating about how secure that website is. And we thought to ourselves, hang on a minute, this hacker thing, it's too easy. Surely, if we're being given a report that lists all the vulnerabilities on it, all we need to do is go find those vulnerabilities and exploit them, right? So Fiona and I decide that that's exactly what we're going to do. One evening, we sit down, we start reading a report, and then we get to the term called Poodle TLS. No. And then there's a little more information section. So Fiona and I, just for a little context, didn't study computer science, but we're software testers and we have a fair idea of how computers work, but a poodle to us is fluffy and has four legs. 
we don't really understand how it's got anything to do with security. So we decide we're just going to leave this small little detail and continue reading the reports and see what else is in there. And then merrily, we're just reading and reading, and then we get to something called heartbeat extension no. What? We, we don't know what this means. We know a heartbeat is something that pumps blood through our bodies. You have it, we have it, but how is it related to security? Maybe they're talking about the popular UK TV series. <laughs> but no, it doesn't really make sense, right? So maybe if it's not that, then they could be talking about all the various songs called Heartbeat by multiple different artists. But again, doesn't make sense at all. So in the end, we've got a lot of reports that we need to read through. But every time we go through it, we're given these terms that we have no idea what they mean. For the second time since we've gotten together, we were completely stumped. We had no idea what on earth to do with all this information or where the heck we even needed to begin. So it was easy to say that we'd run SSL labs and found the reports of the websites, but we didn't even know how to understand that information. So we were getting together daily and trying to go over everything that we had, but we just didn't seem to be getting anywhere. And we were spending sessions just Googling terms and still not really understanding it. After about a week, it got really frustrating, not knowing what to do or how to do anything. We were trying so hard, but at points we were really close to giving up. So this was a pretty low point for us. So next, we decided that we'd hit up our mentor again because we were really, really stuck. And this time, instead of you know, mapping out the functionality like we did before, we decided that we'd just create a risk profile and map out areas of the website that looked super secure versus areas of the websites that showed signs of weakness. And this allowed us to basically ignore the areas that looked like they'd be too hard for beginners like us to hack, and we stayed well clear of those places. But it also allowed us to find the areas that we could target and potentially exploit in some kind of way. So we did things like inspecting the source code and watching traffic in tools such as Burp Suite and Fiddler. But all these things that we did were super unfamiliar to us, and we had to spend many nights and hours just trying to understand it before we could actually go away and apply them to pizza websites. This essentially meant our ability to find anything took probably twice as long than a standard everyday hacker or someone that actually works in the security realm. So Troy Hunt's Hack Yourself First modules also came in really helpful for us. So there are a series of videos that are aimed at any sort of beginner, beginner developer, beginner tester, any security conscious individuals. So they really helped us when we were feeling the grind of security testing. And once the ball was rolling, we began to find some pretty cool stuff. Only it wasn't things that we were expecting to find. So that opened up a whole new can of worms for us. How legal was the stuff that we were doing? Up until now, we hadn't really been too worried about what we were trying, because it can't really be illegal if you're not expecting to find anything. So now we had to actually look at what we were doing and question the legality of it. Our mentor had talked to us about active and passive recon, and we'd done a whole bunch of passive recon, but here we were entering into this active part of our journey. And although our intentions weren't malicious, we were definitely sitting in this grey hat realm. So keeping that in mind, we excitedly went to our mentor with our findings. Bring, 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 bring. Shit. Uh, I may have stuffed up. Uh, I've accidentally accessed someone's information. Well. It's kind of cool, but it's an issue with the site. Now, we need to determine if you have found a bug. If it's a problem, we may be stepping into a grey area. But 
I have access to a name, a phone number, an email, and an address. Cool. I have to go to a meeting. Don't get arrested until I get back. So that night, Kevin sent us the link to the New Zealand Crimes Act. <laughs> hmm. Seven years. That doesn't seem so bad. But we know that you're not that interested in it because you're Australian. So we've also found the Australians Crimes Act. Basically, if we were Australian, or if we were looking at an Australian website, we'd be looking at 10 years. So we thought we'd share with you some of our findings. And what better way to give them to you, um, what better way to show you than ca categorizing them in the OWASP top 10, which is classic for um, the types of vulnerabilities and weaknesses that are currently prominent in cybersecurity at the moment. So finding number one is that we found that some pizza websites out there were downgrading from HTTPS to HTTP. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware that this means information can be seen if someone's on the same network as you. This meant you know, information that's personally identifiable or sensitive of in any kind of nature is easily seen. So phone number, name, email address, residential address, credit card details, anything can be seen in plain text if someone's on the same network. And this obviously isn't ideal because someone could be snooping and may have malicious intent. And those details are not something you want someone to be able to see so easily. So our second finding was an OWASP A3, a sensitive data exposure. So we accidentally stumbled across this while we were looking for various error pages. And we came across this page that leaked some pretty sensitive information. We were seeing things like a name, a phone number, an email address, and a legitimate residential address. For us, amateur stalkers, this information was a treasure trove, and we found ourselves spiraling down the path of Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google stalking. So although the name that was provided on these contact details didn't actually match the phone number and the email address that was provided, we were able to find the real names pretty easily. What was interesting about this order, though, and it kind of had us questioning whether it was actually a real order, was that it actually only consisted of one singular garlic bread. Who orders just one garlic bread? So we began to question where this information was coming from. Considering the possibility of batch processing, we decided to place an order of our own. So under the pseudonym of Jen Barber, we looked over the menu before eventually settling on one garlic bread. Unfortunately for us, the contact details that we provided weren't updated on the page that we were viewing. So that was kind of a bust. But on the bright side, it wasn't a complete loss because the garlic bread was pretty tasty. The fact that we're able to see these contact details, it wasn't the only cause for concern because we were actually able to see a username and a password and plain text in the source code. So even if these details were dummy details that were created by a developer, the fact that they gave real access to log in and edit the details was alarming. So our third finding is not a bug as such, but we still think it's pretty cool. So Fiona and I got to learn all about the robots.txt file. And essentially, this is a website's way of disclosing to web crawlers which page paths they would like indexed. And so naturally, we go and look at what all the pizza websites have got there. And we find that some of them are disclosing their admin page, which if they want to do that, they can. And so Fiona and I decide that we'd actually go and check out those admin pages and see what the haps is. And when we get there, we notice, obviously, you've got a username field and a password field. So 
we fire up our VPN and use all the common bad practice usernames out there. Things like admin, admin01, the name of the pizza establishment, or the name of the person that owns it. And for the password field, we decide that we'd Google the top 10 most common passwords and give those a crack. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at it, we weren't very successful here. But we did note two things. Firstly, we tried many combinations, and I mean many. And at no point did they lock us out or time us out, which makes us think that they probably have broken authentication and session management issues here. Another thing that we noticed is that we were never blacklisted, showing that they're probably not looking at their logs as often as they should, meaning that there's insufficient monitoring going on as well. So our next finding was an OWASP A7, a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Troy Hunt had talked to us about how to use a URL bar to launch a cross-site scripting attack. So using those techniques and with the help from our mentor, we managed to create a pop-up box. Now, this is probably one of my favorite findings because it kind of took a bit of playing around to get it working. Chrome, it wouldn't allow us to play around with a URL bar. IE and Safari, they weren't much luck either. But finally, success came with Firefox. Getting a number to display in the field was also relatively simple. But the text took a bit more playing around, as standard quotation marks were being commented out. Now to me, this friendly little pop-up box with this harmless little greeting is completely innocent. But our mentor has assured us that it does still break the law. Someone with malicious intent could exploit this vulnerability and inject dangerous content that would be viewed on the, to the users of the website, which isn't a great thing. So the last thing that we found was a broken access control issue. So Fiona mentioned earlier how we placed our own order to prove or disprove a theory that we had about an order we found. And while we were doing this, we became familiar with the URLs that were presented at each stage of the process. So for example, when we placed our order and chose our pizza, our toppings, all that sort of thing, um, we became familiar and noted down the URL. And the same with when we were presented with the confirmation page and with the payment page. And kind of using our tester mindset, we decided that we just play around with some of those values in the URL bar. And we weren't really expecting much from it. But we did manage to find other people's orders. So it's not that big a deal that, you know, Person A ordered eight pizzas versus person B ordered one pizza. But we could see things like name, number, phone, uh, email address, residential address. Again, all these sort of sensitive information um, things that shouldn't be so readily and easily available to some random snooping around. So as we've just been through, we actually managed to find six of the OWASP top 10. So to do a quick re recap, we found an OWASP A2, broken authentication and session management, when we saw a website that was supporting weak passwords. There wasn't any sort of two-factor authentication, and although we didn't try it, we think that it was susceptible to brute force attack. We found an OWASP A3, a sensitive data exposure, when we saw the contact details of an individual, so the name, the phone number, the email address, and the address. We also found broken access control, an OWASP A5, when we were able to use the order number of another individual and bring up those order details. We also saw a website that was downgrading from HTTPS to HTTP, a great example of security misconfiguration. And also, let's not forget that friendly little pop-up box that we created, an example of cross-site scripting. Although we couldn't actually prove it, the whole time our IP address wasn't blacklisted, so we suspect that there was insufficient logging and monitoring. So right there, that's six of the OWASP top 10. But we weren't happy with that, 
So we also found a website that was using Apache, which I'm sure a lot of you already know. It's a component with known vulnerabilities, a list of which keeps expanding with each release. So we thought we'd share some of the things that we learned along the way during this project. Um, especially as complete beginners to this realm, we wanted to share what it's like to get into the security area. Keep it simple, stupid. So the main thing for me was that everything was surprisingly and frustratingly simple once you knew about it. So I spent ages looking for the admin page of this website. I was looking into what CMS it was using as to an indication of where I might find it. I tried a whole bunch of different variations before eventually finding it under slash admin. So when I excitedly took that finding to our mentor, his first guess was, yep. Was it slash admin? Yeah, I guess looking back, that is the obvious first choice. So another thing for me was that I often found things when I wasn't really looking for them. So it would lead me to finding them in this long, drawn out, complex process. Whereas if I'd taken a step back and looked at the situation, I could have found it a lot simpler. An example of that is I found the username, uh, the password um, by watching the network traffic when I logged in as the individual. Um, again, a mentor's way was somewhat easier by just inspecting the source code. So Fiona and I took this project on knowing that it would take up a lot of our time. But one thing that we did often was compare ourselves to people who actually worked in this industry. And because we're so new, we spent ages just trying to learn concepts and all these different things before we went away and applied them on pizza websites. And we would often get discouraged by how long things took compared to someone who's actually working in security. But we have come to realize that this is totally OK. And it's normal to crawl and walk before you can run. So if you do start out in security, don't, don't compare yourself to others who work in it. And don't be alarmed when things take a lot longer than what you expect them to do, too. Another thing that we recommend if you are starting out and are doing a project in security is to have a mentor. They are super, super handy and so great to have. There were many, many times when Fiona and I wanted to throw the towel in and wave our little white flag because we thought it wasn't for us and it was just too hard. But lucky for us, we had someone that helped us out and was able to give us motivation and teach us things that would help us continue doing this project. Another reason having a mentor is so excellent is they're grateful when you're treading down the law-breaking road. It's, we, we aren't trying to do anything malicious. All we want to do is learn about hacking and about security. So we don't know what, what really constitutes ethical hacking, but it's great to have someone that can say, hey, if you push that button or if you run that script, you're technically breaking the law. So it's awesome to have someone with knowledge that's experienced, that works in the industry to give you a hand when you need it. So what now? We had all of these really awesome results, but we hadn't really done anything with them. So about a week before we first presented this talk, a mentor came to us and he gave us two options. One, we go to start with the vulnerabilities that we found, or two, slightly less advised option, that we go ahead with our talk, drop a whole bunch of names, and hope to start a jail long enough to finish the talk. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, the sensible option wasn't too appealing, because a week out from the presentation, it meant that we'd have to cut back a lot of our presentation slides, which wasn't too appealing. But because CERT is an organization that's looking to improve the overall cybersecurity, and it is relatively simple to report vulnerabilities to them, we decided to go with CERT. But before we could do that, we needed to learn how to encrypt our email traffic so that we could send what we'd found safely. And before we knew it, we were learning about public keys, 
private keys, and this guy called Ed Snowden. Now, there are two main things that we had to be careful of here. We didn't want to accidentally incriminate ourselves when we were sharing our vulnerabilities with CERT, and we also didn't want anyone with malicious intent to intercept what we'd found. Otherwise, we might as well be handing over the keys to the pizza stores. So, as Fiona mentioned, we had to learn a lot about public and private keys. So, we sent emails using PGP to our mentor, and then he sent them back, and we just made sure that we fully understood how to encrypt and decrypt our messages before we sent them off to CERT. And once we were comfortable, once we thought we had the lowdown on it, we decided that we'd fire that email off, and then we waited eagerly for their reply. We waited. And we waited. And we waited. Eventually, an email response was received. Only, it wasn't actually received by us. Our mentor had received the email response from CERT. And so that had us kind of confused. I didn't remember including our mentor's details in the email to CERT. Neither did Catherine. Out of curiosity, we decided to go back and have a look at what we'd sent. And that's when we realized that we'd made another stuff up. Instead of copying and pasting a carefully and well-crafted email to CERT, we accidentally encrypted the response from our mentor, giving us the green light to go ahead and email them. So now is where we blow your mind with what happened next, what happened after we emailed CERT. So, are you ready? We still haven't heard back from them, so we're still waiting. We just want to say a massive thank you to our mentor, Kevin, who's here. Um, he helped Woo. us in this project. Yeah, thank you so much for all the hard work you put in. There's no way we could have done it without you. So when we started this project, we had no idea how far we'd get, or if we'd even find anything. But now that we know the basics, we're ready to take it even further. It was so much fun, and we learned heaps of stuff along the way. We hope that we continue these projects, and hopefully see you all next year. Round of applause.